Thomas, Janash Tim is considered a big organization, and we don't normally do a free plug for big companies, but yours in particular intrigued us because you're helping persons or people with disabilities. So tell us about why you embarked on a journey to help um, persons with dip- disabilities. And, um, you know, do you have a member in your family? Tell us your story. Um, first of all, can I just ask what do you mean by big? I know, not because normally our company, uh, our Free Block Friday, we only do like uh, small home based businesses to promote that. Yeah, okay. less than less than five five employees. Yeah. It's a home. It's a cottage, real cottage, like from the kitchen. Yeah. yeah. Still, I still consider myself a, a, a Janesh team, a kacang putih company. You know? <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So actually, uh, um, well, the reason why I started this is because, um, you know, I've been a corporate man for 25 years. I've worked in big multinational companies, um, was an expat for 15 years. Uh, by the way, I'm originally from Penang. And, um, and, uh, we won't hold that against you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very proud. It's one of the things I'm proud of is Penang, you know. Right. Um, so uh, uh, when I left corporate life at the very young age, I was 47 years old, I wanted to spend time with the family because family had moved to Melbourne. And uh, I thought I'd take a few years off. But during that time, when I left corporate life, I joined a computer school for the blind a board of trustees. I was invited. And, um, and when I saw how a blind person used the computer, I was totally kind of, uh, you know, amazed. And and I asked them, so how many of you after the training actually work? Because I could see that they could work, you know. But unfortunately, most of them, you know, um, don't work. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, hardly two or three of out of 500 blind people they train were actually working. So I, I tried to, as a board member, tried to, you know, because I, I knew a lot of big companies and their CEOs, tried to introduce them. And everybody is always amazed. But then... Um, and want to do something with these uh, blind graduates. But then in the course of implementation, it doesn't work. It, it's just everybody's busy and, you know, and, and you, you spin your wheels for, I spent two and a half years doing that and decided that that was not getting me anywhere. So I decided that, you know, let's start a company and let's put them to work. And, uh, and that's, that's how it started. And of course, you know, bl- the blind are actually a bit of a challenge. Um, because there are certain things they cannot do, you know. And, um, and so we thought, then what about other disabilities? So if you're in a wheelchair, then and you have full use of your other faculties, then you almost have no disability. And what we did was because we started this in the Philippines, commuting was a major, major problem, even for normal people. Mm. Uh, it's not uncommon for people to spend two to three hours commuting each way to go to work. And uh, yeah, yeah. and so for people with disabilities, it was really, really difficult and expensive, you know. So we had to, to make it work. We had to start with a work-from-home model. And so we are, in a way, very, very... Ahead fortunate. of the game. You guys are ahead of the game. Yeah, we are 100% work from home um, uh, since, well, more than 12 years. And, um, and we have now 130 people on the payroll. And they are scattered over six continents. <laughs> Wow. wow, that's incredible. Yeah, and um, well, we have people in Latin America, in Canada, in Jamaica, in Ghana, in Zimbabwe, in Macedonia, and you know, all over the place, you know. And um, um, so, so we were very um, fortunate that we started with that. So, today we have a very interesting uh, remote work company which most people still don't understand. And in fact, in view of this COVID 19, a lot of I attend a lot of webinars about people talking about remote work and consultants and what have you. And I tell you, they all don't, haven't figured it out yet. Okay. Well, so, now we know who to, to come to find yeah, out yeah. more. Okay, so, so it's a lot of talk and a lot of theory, but nobody has actually done it. You know? So we have right. done it for a long time. So the second thing that we, we did was very fortunate was that we started by saying, oh, so what can we do? You know, people working from home, a whole bunch of disabled people. And um, I happened to be helping a company in Singapore at the time uh, with an online MBA program. And I looked at the way they ran this. I said, this is very interesting. It is something for the future. And so we said, that's it. E-learning is what you do. <laughs> and uh, I think it was, the, it was the right thing today when you look back now. But we were at least seven years too early. All right. Right. So uh, the company bled for six years. We only started to break even in year number seven. So over the last five years, we managed to make modest profits. 
Because every time we make a little bit extra profit, what we do is we hire more people mm-hmm. and train them and develop them. So, um, yeah, so it's been a bit of a struggle, but today we are, I would say, very, very comfortable. Well, I wouldn't say very comfortable. We are comfortable. Thanks, actually, I mean, I'm sorry to say this, but thanks to COVID-19, our business grew by 50% last year. Well, you know, it's, it's always nice to hear stories where people have benefited, do you know? Um, that's always a positive note um, we can all feed off. So tell me, Thomas, so what's your guiding principle that's kept you thinking about the importance of helping people with disabilities? Well, I think it was, I, I think throughout my, my I came from, uh, I would say, um, lower middle class family. I mean, from Penang, a small town in those days. Uh, my, my parents never had any form of motorized transport, not even, um, they went around on bicycles. And, uh, and we never had our own home. Uh, uh, we lived in my grandmother's house. Um, so, but I managed to, you know, get myself a good education and, um, and started a corporate life, which I did, I did very, very well. And I say that, uh, and so I was supposed, I suppose even in the earlier parts of my career, I've always been the kind of person who would be cheering for the underdog, mm-hmm. even in, in sporting activities, you know, I was cheering for the underdog. So I suppose there's that kind of thing in my mind that, you know, the, the underdog is somebody that we should not forget, you know. And, um, and of course, this stumbling onto people with disabilities was quite by accident. I mean, I, I mean, I was the country manager for my last company in, in the Philippines. I mean, I had a lot of invitations to sit on the boards of NGOs. I mean, uh, and, um, and I, I would never have time, right? I was working seven days a week. And, and when I quit my corporate job, I was stuck with a garden leaf clause. I don't know whether you understand what that is. No idea. I, what is that? What's yeah. that? Well, in, in companies in very senior positions, and I didn't even know that when I signed all the papers to join the company, there is a garden leaf clause which says that if you quit, we have the right to say we continue to pay you for one year to sit there and do nothing. And right. So I was kind of stuck in the Philippines, you know, on my own. <laughs> my family was in Melbourne. I could travel and go home and see them as often as I like, but at short notice, I have to be in Manila. And, uh, and so I had plenty of time on my hands. So, um, so I had to, you know, say yes to one of the many invitations to join this uh, NGO. So, so that, was the, that was the turning point, actually, that I learned to see how, you know. And of course, when you work with people with disabilities and you get to know them well, I mean, they become my best friends, um, you then realize that... Um, given the right opportunity, they, they can thrive, right? I, mean, I have people who work with me for more than 10 years, you know? Mm. Uh, uh, and, and I give one example. I mean, Ryan is one of my first hires in 2008, I think it was. And, um, and he's polio victim. He's in a wheelchair since the age of two. He has limited use of one hand and he's blind in one eye. <laughs> and he doesn't have any... Um, college degree or anything, right? So he's living in the slums when I hired him. I actually went to see him and he had a mattress underneath some stairs and he slept there with his wife. Wife has only one arm. And, uh, but he managed to train himself to use the computer. He was doing a little bit of, at the time he bought a dot matrix printer and helped some small oh. companies print forms, you know, uh, that kind of thing and made a few cents, you know, along the way. Mm. And uh, entrepreneurial with, spirit he had. Yeah, and today he 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 manages uh, the biggest department in the company. I think he's at twenty five people under him. Wow! My goodness. He's doing, so, jobs, he's doing jobs for the Singapore government, for Microsoft, for you know. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So when you say that they are, they train themselves in computers, so basically, is it coding or do they just do word processing or? Um, everything. Uh, so we have, uh, for example, we have Dewey from a place called Dong Hoi in Vietnam. And he, uh, he, he has no oh. formal training in computer. So, th- Thomas, so can we just interrupt you a minute? Can you just turn all your notifications off? Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah and on your computer too, if you could just um, just pause them or just go into sort of uh, night mode or do not disturb just for a while. You're Let a busy me... man and, and we're hearing it all, <laughs> which is lovely, but... <laughs> Let me just shut this uh, sure. few things which I have here. Um. So, Dury, I mean, same thing. I mean, he doesn't have any formal training in computers or anything. He just learned coding himself. Right. Uh, today, he's our top 
uh, programmer in the company and he's coding uh, platforms for companies with 3,000 employees. Gosh, I wouldn't even know where to start to learn to code myself. <laughs> yeah. I, I, can't, I don't know how to code. So, uh, <laughs> right. But you know, it's one of those things, right? Mm -hmm. So what if you're in a wheelchair? So what if you can only have one hand? So what if you, you know, and, and we have a large number of refugees who work for us. So what, so what if you're a refugee? You, you, can, you can do this. Yes. Given an opportunity, anybody can do anything, right? Yeah. Exactly. And, 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 our, and our clients are all over the place. So we have done, you know, for doing, he's done projects with uh, companies in Thailand, in Malaysia. I mean, uh, and he's Vietnamese. Mm. <laughs> Vietnam. So Thomas, what are the biggest challenges you face when trying to get a um, person with disabilities into the workforce? Um, I think that the, the, what we need to what we need from them is to be very upfront about um, about their disability. Uh, very often, they try to hide some of their disabilities, and that's actually quite bad because if we know what your disabilities are, we can then think about where you fit into the organization yeah. mm -hmm. and how you will you will fit with the with the team, right? And uh, but if we don't know, and then we don't realize that you can't do certain things, and then you don't perform, and you wonder why, and then they thought we find out we can't. Example, we lost an Australian client many years ago because one of our guys who was very good at uh, IT, he was doing the kind of IT uh, support for, for an Australian client. Um, but he's in a wheelchair and he, he types with um, his knuckles mm -hmm. uh, because he can't even straighten his fingers. He's uh, kind of uh, had that problem. And um, he's today actually heading uh, our, our IT support team, you know. But at that time, he didn't tell us that he was also dyslexic. I, I see. see. And he sent messages to our client, it totally pissed off the client. Right. And we lost that client. I mean, not a big client, it was just a, a, a mm. starting out and all the kind of stuff. But he almost, we almost sacked him, you know. <laughs> but right. Do you think he knew that he was dyslexic? I mean, it's interesting because yes. I know so many adults who... He knew. He knew, but he didn't want to tell us. And, right. and we sometimes have that. So that's a big challenge. Uh, so in, uh, in we are a commercial organization. I mean, uh, for profit, tough, you guys. Yeah. I think you talk to my employees; they'll tell you I'm, a, I'm a bit of a you know taskmaster and slave driver. You know, no excuses because you know what our clients don't give us any excuse. Huh? Eighty percent of our clients don't even care that we are a social impact company. So none of your clients know that uh, you had you. If very few, with disability. very few. The only client, there are only two clients I can think of who, who gave us business because we are a social impact company. One is Microsoft uh, and the other one is um, a company in Singapore that's into HR recruitment. We, we, we out, they outsource all the database management to us, you know. Right. So, so talking about sort of the job scope and the capabilities, not everyone is a good worker and that might be the same for those you help to place in jobs. Mm -hmm. How do you ensure that a client gets a high level of quality employee? That's precisely, you know, what I just mentioned. We are quite, um, how do you call it? We are quite strict and quite stern. And, um, and so if you can't perform, then you're out. Do they, you know? But you'd have to go through some... Um interview phase or like oh yeah yeah everybody is interviewed and then we put them through training and then they some of them actually work as uh, trainees for a while in fact we just started a program in malaysia we took on 10 uh, pwd in malaysia okus uh, we call them in malaysia mm -hmm. um just uh, in december um as a tr uh, on traineeship so um I think we, we give them six months traineeship and if they perform well, they will be assimilated in the company. In fact, some of them have already been assimilated. Uh, if not, then at the end of it, say thank you very much, you know, bye-bye, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, that's actually, um, I mean, it, it's a, we are a commercial organization and, uh, and it's not just me being strict, uh, it's everybody else. Well, I you know, somebody, somebody like Ryan, right? He's clawed himself from the bowels of society and sitting in a nice, you know, job now with a good income. He could buy a car, have a driver, buy a house, you know. You think he's going to let, you know, poor performers screw up everything for him? Oh. <laughs> yeah, no. You many, many people like that, they have a job because they can, you know, everybody pulls their weight. So if you're not pulling your weight, then... We, we will give a little bit of allowance 
you know, in fact, many of our staff, if they cannot perform, then maybe they go on part-time. Mm. Right? You can go on part-time or whatever it is. We, we, we try to adjust as much as possible. The important thing is you really want to do it. Right. Of course, but of course, you have those people who, you have people who try to do as little as possible. They try to get away with doing as little as possible. I tell you what, we'll find out. Yeah. We've been operating as a remote company for more than 10 years. We know how to figure out whether people are working or not. Yeah. Actually, you know, your expertise in this could help uh, a lot of teachers also trying to figure yeah. out whether the students are actually learning or not. I was thinking the <laughs> same <laughs> thing. <laughs> like, students are just well, like, you know, yeah. you know there, is, there is, actually, there is, there, there is a very simple solutions to, to improve outcome in education. I mean, in schooling, for example, I mean, the flipped classroom is a concept which I've always felt that, you know, why more schools are not adopting a flipped classroom. What's a flipped classroom? A flip, you know, traditionally is that you got 30, 40 kids in the class, you got a teacher in the front of the class, and every time, every year, she goes through the same thing, right? She tells mm. the class, this is biology, this is chemistry, this, you know, and she delivers, right, for one hour, uh, one hour lesson, right? After that, she gives homework to the kids. So the kids go home, they try to do the homework and try to recollect what the teacher said for the one hour. <laughs> How many kids do you think would be listening for one hour non stop? Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. uh, as a kid, I was ADHD, so there was no way I could have, you know. Then, of course, they cannot remember. So how to do their homework? They ask their parents, and their parents can't deal with it. Then their siblings, and then after that, use private tutoring. So there you go. There's the private tutoring industry has, has, has done so well, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, but the whole thing is, is a bit silly. So what the teacher delivers in class should be recorded. And at home, the students should be watching the video of the teacher giving the, the chemistry lesson, right? Mm -hmm. And then when they go to class, they do their homework in front of the teacher. They may be gathered into groups in class and everything. And so when they need help, the teacher is there. That so, makes beautiful sense. Why aren't we doing it like that? For me, it's a very simple thing. I've been telling everybody that I come across, this is a very, very simple thing to do. Yeah. And the teacher, isn't it more fun than we standing there and delivering the same bloody thing over and over again? I am going to take this to the headmaster <laughs> of my son's school the minute where I leave work today. So thanks, Thomas. But listen, let's get back to your company. Yeah, actually, Thomas, if you don't mind me asking one thing. Yeah. Because you said like uh, you're, you're a taskmaster and whatnot, right? How mm. often have you had to sack? Start. Oh, um, I would say, <laughs> sorry, let's, sorry, let's sorry. say in the course of last year, in the course of last year, we probably sacked out of the 100 people we started with, we probably sacked about 15 of them. Was it because of work performance or because of? Uh, most of us, most of it because of dishonesty. Oh, oh. Cheating. Lying and cheating. There's a thing that I, we cannot tolerate in the company. Okay, mm. but is it, it's like one one chance you mess it up, you're gone, or? Well, the thing is that if you make a mistake or you did something and you apologize for it, I think we we accept that. The the thing that we don't accept is that then you start lying, you start to pass blame to somebody else. Um, then sorry, that one zero tolerance. It's hard to step out of the survival mode of, you know, doggy dog world yeah, though. Yeah. yeah. I understand yeah. that. Okay. So Thomas, you, you know, you started with um, persons with disabilities and today you're helping refugees, retirees and other marginalized communities. What was the sort of catalyst for the shift of focus? Well, when we started, it was quite clear that we would actually cater for marginalized communities, not just PWDs. Right. right. Uh, and connect them to the global economy. That's the mission of our company. And we have always stated that um, uh, a P, we start with the with the P, with the uh, PWD, and and we've always talked about refugees. I even have discussions with um, leper communities. Mm -hmm. um, I talked in, in Indonesia. I talked to um, HIV infected uh, um, organization uh, people in. Zimbabwe, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, talked to in Malaysia, I spoke to a dato regarding um, ex-offenders, um, mm -hmm. even working with people in the penal system. So actually, if you know, think about it, you know, prisoners will be a very, very reliable workers, right? <laughs> you <laughs> know where they live. Thing, you know? <laughs> you know, thing, right? so, so, so in fact, I'm so happy to find another company in, in, in Singapore now doing this. 
called Agape Connecting People. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's an ex-offender himself and he started a call center. In fact, he's a call center outside in Singapore and he has got two call centers in Changi Prison. <laughs> right. So, nice. How fantastic that is, right? So I've always mm. thought about this. Um, and then, uh, of course, women in oppressed environments, something I have started, they started to do. So we have been hiring women in Pakistan and Afghanistan in particular. Mm-hmm. who actually cannot work, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a kind of, it's not acceptable to be working. Um, and uh, for the seniors, actually, the interesting thing is that it started in Malaysia. Oh, uh, interesting. Uh, you Why might have been Malaysia? Hire, um, hireseniors.com. Why Malaysia though? I mean, do we have a high number of seniors not working and they want to work? Uh, well, we came across real gems. Uh. We got um, the head of our English department. Uh, she is 71 years old, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and she's doing e-learning uh, English. Wow. Fantastic. And uh, one of our top sales uh, managers, she's um, 60 plus, 61, I think. Uh, she used to be an accountant. Now she's doing sales. Very, very good. Both are ladies. <laughs> the aunties, well, us, the us women, we, we know how to do a few things. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and refugees, it was very simple. Uh, in, in March 2018, a friend of mine in Singapore, she approached me because she was with the Jesuit Refugee Services. She was a volunteer there. Mm-hmm. And she asked whether, you know, she knew that I hired people with disabilities working from home. She said, why, if they can work from home, why can't you hire Refugees, I said, well, if they have qualifications, if they're able to work, we consider. So she sent me, uh, she got the Jesuit Refugee Services Indonesia people to send me 14 resumes. I remember I got them on a Wednesday and I only opened up the resumes on a Friday. And the first resume I opened up was a fellow who actually, his background was, he was an e-learning designer. And he was running a software called Articulate. And Articula is one of the software that we use, uh, very widely used for e-learning conversion, which is hard to find people who have competence in. Mm. And, and I was so excited that I called up my, my whole team. I said, you know, in, over the weekend, we interviewed with test team. He started work on Monday. Wow. Swift. And from that, from that 14, uh, we hired five. And so I thought, mm, I'm going to pay them a visit. So I went to Bogor to visit them. And I find they're just, just lovely people. These are not your rough and tough refugees, you know. These are all middle, upper middle class families who had cars, who had houses and everything. And because they were persecuted, they got to pack up and leave. Mm. You know, some of the family members were killed. Yeah. You know? And uh, many of them have better, you know, have uh, MacBooks, you know, better PCs than I have, you know. And um, but they ended up being stuck in Indonesia. They're being mm. told at least 20 years. Uh, wow. Yeah, and, and they, they have no rights, they have not, no nothing. And but it's we, just someone giving them an opportunity to show what they can do. And then, yeah. and it's not so much about you p- taking pity on them, like, oh, I'll, I'll give you a job. But you're like, oh my God, this guy yeah, knows yeah. how to use this software. And, and, yeah, and this guy, at that time, we had a project with the water utility board in Singapore. We tended for, we got a project and we were falling behind. And he came in, he worked overnight many, many nights, you know, to help us catch up, you know. Wow. So, so you know, I mean, they, 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 have, they have the capability. They want so to work. they have the capabilities, obviously, otherwise you wouldn't be hiring them because you're a for-profit company. So I love that, right? Um, but most employers would be skeptical to hire a PWD and, you know, um, someone from the marginalized communities as well. Has it gotten more challenging to find and train these individuals or less lately, the past couple of years? I would say, yeah, less. Because uh, I think one of the reasons is because we do have quite a bit of visibility now. Uh, we are known, you have know, been published around the world. I mean, we were in Forbes magazine and all that. We are published by two German government publications. So we have a lot of people apply to us. So it's a lot easier now um, to find people um, but to find good people, I think it's a similar with the normal environment. It's always difficult mm-hmm. to find good people, right? So, so in our situation, um, yeah, it's, it's not so easy to find the good ones. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the little, you know, the rough diamonds, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and our, my experience is that their experience and qualification is not the most important thing. 
the most important thing is their determination. Mm, it's a mindset. So talking yeah. about rough diamonds, generally, how long does it take for you, um, for you to train a potential employee before putting them through your organization? Well, the thing is that if you don't have, you are not using a, a, a PC and accessing the internet, then it's not worth the, the, us trying to, to work with you because, you know, I think something is, I think something will be wrong if you're not somebody who actually uses the internet today, right? Mm. Um, so it will be, really be a bridge too far, you know? So basically, if you're accessing the internet and using a PC, you, we can actually train you. Um, the training uh, um, can take probably... I would say the good ones can complete the training in a matter of three weeks. Right. Gosh. Some people take that's, up two months. Um, that's because still zippy. We put you through what we call a virtual office training. Mm. Right. So you learn all the tools that we use and all that. So, and company culture, stuff like this, right? Yeah. Then you go to, go to the company culture uh, training and we call it the NTMO, new team member orientation. That takes, or that will take actually a few months, but the initial training will be quick because with the onboarding, we actually have somebody who will kind of be your buddy and, you know, take you through the, you, you're always somebody that you can talk to um, as a new employee, I think for the first, at least three months in the company. Right. We have a That's kind of a mentor. Nice, yeah. Yeah. So do you have any exams that uh, your trainees have to undergo? Yes, yes. All the training has, they have tests, yeah. So did they come up with a certificate from you then or a certificate from that course? Yes, we can actually issue a certificate. In fact, uh, in Singapore, we actually have run this for the uh, programs funded by the Singapore government mm. and, uh, and issued some certificates. Yeah, we can, we can issue certificates. It's not an issue. Okay. Yeah. So, so um, you know, regular headhunting companies sometimes, you know, get the signing bonuses and stuff like that. How, do you guys work on that sort of premise as well? Signing bonus? Mm-hmm. Um, in our case, we don't have to uh, give signing bonus because most of the people we employ are not employed. <laughs> You're right, right. <laughs> okay. Are there any <laughs> cases where um, somebody is really, really highly qualified to do a particular job and you really, really want him, but because of their background, because of what they've been through and everything, um, mentally, emotionally, they've been affected. And do you ever do any... Um, checks on that. Do you have a, a test for that as well? Mentally affected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or even support systems yeah. for that. Yeah. Well, I think that um, we will take them on. We have had um, a number of people. In fact, last year, we had two of our employees who had to stop work because of mental health issues. And when we took them on, we knew they had mental health issues. No, sorry. One of them we knew had mental health issues. The other one we didn't know, you know. Uh, we tried very hard. We tried to talk to the, the, the family and all that. And there was one of them who actually had to stop work then came back, had to stop work again, came back again. And then the third round, we just said, we just can't deal with this anymore, right? So we do give the opportunity. Uh, i give another example. Um, I think you won't mind me mentioning this. Our HI, our HI director uh, had a very, very illustrious career. He worked for big, big multinational companies. I think that his last... HR job, he managed, he managed HR function for a company with 40,000 employees. Jeez, Gosh, okay. that's large. Yeah. So he, his parents passed away and he slipped into depression. He had to stop work and he went for treatment for one year. And after that, it was kind of difficult to get back. Uh, you know, so he found our company and applied to join our company. And I told him that, you know, I cannot afford you, you know. Your last drawn pay was 12,000 US a month. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> That's know? a tidy sum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, in the end, he just said, you know, I'm prepared to work for next to nothing. And... It's not about the money. Right. No, I'm just wondering because, uh, with, especially with refugees and whatnot, mm. they've come through some really tough times. I mean, like some of them might have PTSD or whatever. And then yeah. I, don't, I wonder how they And then the pressure with... of like learning and then going oh, to right, new yeah. work environment. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm just wondering yeah. about that. We, we, we try very hard uh, to, to, to deal with that, but we are not experts. Um, we actually have ex external counsellors. We pay for external counsellors to, to look after our people. And anybody who wants to talk to our external counsellor uh, can do it. Totally confidential. We don't know who goes and how often. Mm -hmm. All we get, because we trust our counsellor, she's actually a PWD herself in Jamaica. 
Oh, and, cool. Uh, and she sends a bill every month and we just pay. <laughs> I like, Gosh, I, I like, it. yeah, I, I, can you be my boss? <laughs> Everybody says very, everything's very objectively done. I love yeah, it. Yeah. So yeah. tell us a story, sort of um, like a sort of start to finish story of someone who's come through Janashtim and, you know, succeeded beyond your imagination. Uh, well, there are so many. I mean, the one that I mentioned earlier on, Ryan, I mean, it's one example. Uh, the other one, um, i give an example would be, I mean, I talked about Dewey from, from Vietnam, right? Mm -hmm. So who else can I talk about? You know, I can talk about my executive assistant. Her name is Nadia. Uh, and um, she actually lives in, or well, she was living in Bagan Sarai. A small town in northern Para. Mm. Uh, she just got married last December and uh, now moved to KL. The husband is in KL. Uh, Nadia has cerebral palsy and she, um, she can move only the tip of this finger, right hand, only the index finger, only that part. She can't even bend this, this next, you know. Gosh. And so her mother, you know, cleans up every morning, sits in a chair, turns on the computer, puts her hand onto the mouse and the mouse is upside down. You got to figure out how she use the mouse upside down. And then she works. Okay. And, uh, and she actually worked for a, a, a subsidiary of Job Street before, you know, with formatting res resumes and all that. So when she joined us, she did various positions in the company. I mean, the support and this and that, uh, you know, operations. And she got, do, she did so well in the in all her uh, her, her different jobs that um, she started training our new staff, and so when I needed the next day assistant, um, you know she I thought she would be a, she good. so she actually runs my life. Okay. Oh, something you know uh, uh, you have to go through her because I don't I don't I hardly put things into my own calendar. Also, basically, this interview, this chat it was organized by enough. Nadia. Yeah, I, I only kind of see it on my calendar and say, Thanks, oh, I, Nadia. Fact, Thank you. Thanks, Nadia. I was, I was wondering, I said, I don't have any information. I don't have a list of questions. I don't have <laughs> I'm going to this totally, you know. Right, right. Yes, without any foreknowledge. So, yeah. Thomas, you were mentioning a little bit earlier on um, that this pandemic has been kind to Janash Tim. Can you mm. tell us a little bit more about how, you know, um, Janash Tim was affected sort of going back to the start and over the year, last year. How it was affected? What do you mean? This uh, pandemic. Well, I think when we first had the pandemic breakout, I, had a, I did a call a video with my employees. I think it was in late February or early March. And I said to them, I said, look, um, we can run our operations, no problem. Uh, but my concern is that our clients will fail, right? Because if our client's business go, goes under, we have no more client, right? Mm -hmm. So we lose that. But fortunately, our clients are mostly multinational companies and government departments, right? So, so they made up like, you know, probably 80, 90% of our, of our revenues. So, so I said, look, but if any of them were to kind of shut down their operations or you know, uh, cut their expenses and the, you know, the trading part has been cut, then we will lose business. So I said to them, I said, there's one thing I can tell you is that we are not going to make anybody redundant, but we might all have to take a pay cut. Right. <laughs> might have to, right? So, um, so I kind of warned everybody. And, but then a month or two later, you know, it, everything looked good. And um, uh, in fact, we had a second increment last year. In the, I think it was in, in June, you know, uh, which is not normal for us, you know. Uh, the company did well, so our business increased. We have a lot more inquiries. In fact, we still have a lot of inquiries, a lot of proposals that we made mm -hmm. still pending. Right. Uh, but fortunately, our business, our revenues did grow by fifty percent. Fifty percent. Yeah. Doubled. The fifty. Well. Yeah, fifty percent, not double. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah, actually, you know I'm what? terrible at math. Yeah. I don't know if you noticed time. that. <laughs> actually, the thing is, uh, Thomas, the reason why we got in touch with you, like, uh, we're not even sure who from your organization actually got in touch with us. Usually, us is right. We get in touch with some very, very small companies who are struggling during this pandemic, 
uh, mm. people who have lost jobs and whatnot, and then they've, they've started a bakery or something like that. And then uh, they need some uh, publicity push. One of the reasons why we uh, found your story very interesting was that it wasn't so much about your personal, not about Janash team itself, but about the people that you're helping. Mm. And we thought it was brilliant because your clients, they don't even care that it's, um, it's uh, people who are PWDs working for you, getting mm. their job done. So that's yeah. why we, we thought it was a great story. Who actually got in touch with us about this from your organization though? Um, he's a new guy who applied for a job. His name is beginning with B. I can't remember. No, but, <laughs> but not Benjamin, not Barnaby. Is he part of your marketing team? Yes, yes, yes. He joined the marketing team. <laughs> right. Let me just say he did sorry, a great job. Oh my God. Well, he did a great job at, at sort of highlighting because, uh, you know, as, as JD says, you know, you are not within our scope, but because of the people you work with, because of the people you help, we just uh, couldn't let it slide. Yeah. It's a great story. We love the work that you do. We love the people that you're helping mm. get back into uh, the economy, basically. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. So, so one of the things we normally do for each of our small little companies is to create a jingle for them. Uh, and they usually find it very useful to sell because it gets them on the map. It makes a bit of noise. Not that you guys need this. Yeah, but... I don't know whether you need it or not. <laughs> but have a listen, have a listen, have a yeah, listen to this. We created a radio jingle for you. Check it out. Mm. In 2004, one man set out on a mission to employ those who are marginalized and solving his clients' online training needs. This is Jen Ash Tim. Jen Ash Tim, a pioneer in e-learning, helps your organization level up to innovative services like language coaching, learning design, content digitalization, while providing remote IT and recruitment support. For more information on what Jen Ash Tim has to offer, head to janashtim.com. That's G-E-N-A-S-H-T-I-M.com. Janash Tim, empowering business, enabling business. Nice. Can I post it on my social media? Yes, you yes, can. We need to clean it up a bit, but we'll send it yes, to you. Yes, oh my goodness. Okay, okay. all right. Good, good, good. Fantastic. Because it would show what you thought of it because you're, you're, you're a huge organization yeah. but you're helping other people. But this one, we just thought it might, it might be a little fun thing for other yeah. people to know about you. Yeah, might make some noise in social media for you, which is a good thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Awesome. Well, Thomas, thank you so much. Um, congratulations on, you know, going stronger because of this pandemic and, and, you know, the marginalized are the ones who are hit the worst. I know the blind association here, it's it, the, the people are in terrible states. So it's wonderful to meet somebody who's actually um, putting those people who really need it back into jobs and, and keep them in jobs. So it's wonderful meeting you. Mm-hmm.